was looking at this book. This is back in uh, 1987. And I was because of my dreams. I was my original form of divination was dream divination. And my dreams led me to the tarot. And I, I won't go into that now because we don't have much time. But the, the uh, I've always been an artist. And uh, and I, I got more and more interested as I got more and more interest in, in the tarot. I also became a writer, an author, because I had to explain my images to people. And uh, I, I uh, back in the summer of uh, 1987, I was looking through a uh, a book on uh, alchemy and magic and, and occultism. And I, I came across this particular uh, image that you see before you. It's a, it's a mandala. It's originally from a book called Harmony Mystique from 1636, and it depicts the Philosopher's Stone. Now, the Philosopher's Stone is the goal of alchemy. It's, uh, see, no matter what, you know, al alchemists, um, of course, are the precursors of, of uh, modern science and chemistry and even depth psychology. I mean, uh, they, they basically uh, it's, it's, it's the uh, um, ancestor of our, our modern science. And it, and it stems from ancient Egypt and Greece. Uh, and and alchemists, alchemists could make all different things. I mean, alchemists made paints and medicines and perfumes and all, all kinds of uh, things that chemists might do today. But no matter what they work on, worked on, the alchemists had one major goal, which was to make this magic elixir called the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone um, is not really a stone. They would say it's a stone that's not a stone. It's, it's immaterial. Basically, alchemists believed that everything was alive in the, in the, in the whole uh, universe and whole world. And, uh, and because it's alive, it had a soul, an anima. So, uh, so everything physical was imbued with what they call the anima mundi, the soul of the world. And um, the philosopher's stone, in the philosopher's stone, a, a raw material was taken and put through a process called the, uh, the magnum opus, the great work. And uh, in that process, the, the, the initial uh, material was put through several, many different chemical processes until it was, it basically was killed and revived. And then the soul was revealed. So when the soul was revealed, this, this philosopher's stone was made out of the pure soul. So, so the um, alchemists, when they tried to draw a picture of the philosopher's stone, it does, it's not material, you can't really see it. So they would make symbolic images that we wouldn't call, now we would consider them mandalas in, the, in modern terminology. And these, and these are two mandalas representing the philosopher's stone. Now I was looking at this book, this is back in uh, 1987, and I was looking at, you know, let, let's look at the one on the left first and we'll say, okay, so there's a wreath, which is obviously a crown of thorns. And then there's a heart in the center. So it sort of reminds you of the sacred heart of, of Christ and, and the Christian uh, iconography. And then you see the, the hearts in the center of a cross. But then there's some other symbolism happening. Like there's a rose, uh, a rose bud coming out of the heart and the cross is dividing the background into four images, which represent the uh, the four elements: earth, air, fire, and water. You can see how see the bottom on the bottom left is earth, and then the right's uh, fire, and then air's on the upper left, and uh, water's on the upper right. Um, now, alchemically, the heart represent the soul that animated the four elements. Therefore, it was called the quinta essentia. That's where our English word quintessence comes from. The quinta essentia means the essential fifth element, the soul that inhabits the four elements. The four elements would be dead matter without the soul. The soul is what animates them. In fact, the word animates means comes from soul. To have to be animated is to have soul. So anything that moves, therefore, on its own has soul, and the soul is what moves it. And, and of course, in our modern uh, scientific understanding of the world in physics, we can see that everything, every atom is always moving all the time. So by the alchemical dev, uh, definition of life, the whole world is alive. Now, in this uh, picture, this, this type of mandala is called a quincunx. A quincunx is a, a, a type of mandala in which the fourfold imagery that represents the physical world are, are assigned to the four corners uh, of the picture and then the uh the picture in the center represents the essential fifth element which would be the anima mundi now when i looked at this picture back in 19 
87 for the first time, it occurred to me that the world card in the tarot, um, you know, was symbolically interchangeable with this with this image, because if I thought about I thought about the heart, and I thought and, and this idea came to me. I said, well, the heart represents obviously is a symbol of the soul, in 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 Western uh, symbolism, and I and I thought about the dancing woman, the nude woman on the world card, and how the dancing figure of woman was very similar to Egyptian hieroglyph for one of the aspects of the soul. And, and I think, well, and I think, well, then she could represent the soul. And then I was thinking about the four evangelist symbols in the corner, which in Christian iconography were related uh, to, the, to the four fixed signs of the zodiac and therefore to the four elements and then the four directions and the four seasons. So they represented the fourfold world, just like the four elements do here. So, so I thought about it and I was realizing that, well, if the world card is symbolically interchangeable um, with, the, with this uh, mandala that represents the culmination of the alchemical process, could it be that the trump cards leading up to the world are uh, describing the magnum opus? And then when I said that, it, when I thought that, I mean, um, it was like it was like it, it opened up a portal in my mind. It, it, it was it, it's, this power came out of out of the image, and I suddenly saw out of this portal. I saw all these images, these alchemical images that I had been studying for years. Uh, you know, the, you know, basically correlating themselves with different tarot cards. So I immediately uh, I immediately picked up my uh, copy of Psychology and Alchemy by Jung. And was, which is filled with alchemical pictures. And I started going through the book and writing notes in the margins about which cards they related to. And that's how I came for the, up with the inspiration for the alchemical tarot. So you now you can see here, we have, this is the earliest tarot of Marseille uh, world card. It's the Jean Noble from, six, from approximately 1650. And we can see how the female figure is almost like a female version of Christ because she has the cape and, and the scepter. And then we have the, the four evangelists in the corners, which would have been a Christian symbol of, uh, you know, Christ at the uh, at the last judgment. But you see how the, the woman who is usually this uh, a symbol for the anima mundi is put in the center instead. Now, as we move ahead, these are some now these are some cards from my own collection. The next one to the right is a, a tarot of Marseille card from 1775. See, the, fir the first one's in the uh, National uh, Library in Paris. This one, the next to her on my collection. Uh, and you can see this is the more, what we consider the more standard uh, Tarot Marseille. We see the figure starts, she looks like she's dancing. You see how she's uh, standing on one foot and she's holding two uh, scepters. Okay, this one, the next one's from Milan from 1875. And you see it, some, the, the, the figures become a little more uh, stable, but she still has the, the uh, the shawl wrapped around her. Now, here, here's Pamela Coleman Smith's card from, this is, this is the actual first edition of uh, the Wade Smith uh, deck that was uh, published in 1909. This, the, I don't own this, but I had it on loan when I uh, curated an exhibition of the, of the cards for the uh, uh, Craft and Folk Art Museum in Los Angeles. So you can see, but you can see how Pamela's image is totally based on the traditional Marseille image, and this, and these are, and these are the images I was thinking of: the traditional Marseille image and uh, the Wade Smith version of it. When I was realizing how they were interchangeable, so then I immediately began working on the alchemical tarot. Uh, you know, well, not immediately, but after after some some thought about it, I started putting together the cards. And of course, the first one of the first cards you ha you have to work on is the Fool. So you can see here now. Here's the evolution of my Fool. Um, we have the, uh, like, here's the, the Tarot of Marseille. Now, the, the fool in the Tarot of Marseille is, young, is a jongleur. A jongleur is a traveling performer. And the, and the dog, see, the, the, basically what's happening is the dog's ripping his pants and attacking him because, because uh, you know, the, the fool is a performer from out of town. And we can see that in two aspects here in the symbolism. The dog's attacking him because the dog's there as a guard dog to attack strangers. And also he has a bag of his belongings over his shoulder. And the uh, jongleurs were traveling performers and they went from town to town, juggling and telling jokes and playing music. And they, the music they played was uh, written by troubadours. Um, now, 
so that's why he's, he's dressed motley in this, in, the fest, in this festive outfit. Now you can see one, by the time we get to Pamela Coleman Smith's version, the, the dog has become his friend, you know, and, and, but he's, he's still in a, a dangerous position. He's on the edge of a precipice. And these are, and this, of course, there are a lot of occult interpretations between here and there. Now, when I looked at it, I said, okay, well, the fool is obviously going through this journey. He's coming, he, the clear indication is that he's someone from out of town coming in, he's gonna go through the Trump. So he's do, doing what we call the fool's journey. So, and I said, well, alchemically, then he's like the alchemist going, going through the, the journey. And so I, ba so I came up with this image based on alchemical imagery. You see here, this is, this is uh, you notice how the, the alchemist here at the beginning of the work is blindfolded and he's following his guide, the rabbit. So the rabbit's sort of taking the place of the, of the dog. I thought, I thought of this dog is egging him on, whereas this dog's his friend. Now the rabbit's his guide. And see, so, the, so you see how my picture here is totally based on this picture. Now that's the first image I did for the alchemical tarot. So here, here's the whole Micklespacker uh, alchemical imagery. You see this, there's a, a, a time lapse here. The, here's the fool, the alchemist, he's blindfolded, which means foolishness. The rabbit guides him, he loses his blindfold. The rabbit guides him into the mountain of the alchemical process of the great work. And you see how there's seven steps, each with a, a chemical or uh, process written on them. And then there's the marriage of the king and queen, the sun and moon. And then we have the, the seven gods of the planets, which are the seven metals. And notice the four elements in the corner, making this whole ce center of the mountain, a big, a giant quincunx, just like our world card again. And here's Mercury, who's the god of alchemy at the, at the pinnacle of it. The signs of the zodiac around, around it represent the wheel of the year, which is also, uh, synonymous with the process of the magnum opus. Okay, now the thing was, so I, I created this whole alchemical tarot in this way. Uh, and I was, uh, but, but I realized all along that, the, that the, the cards were not intended to be the alchemical great work, but somehow the message in the cards um, coincided very well with the alchemical great work because they both came from a common idea. See, and what, and that, and what that thing was, was hermeticism. Like hermeticism is the philosophy that's being expressed in alchemy and hermetic philosophy was what was being expressed in the tarot card. So that's why it coincided so well with alchemy. So then I started creating other decks. Now, one of the decks I then, uh, you know, besides creating ones on, with other mystical themes, I tried to do one where I um, basically, I, I call it uh, the, uh, you saw it in the beginning, it's, it's the uh, alchemical, uh, the tarot of the alchemical magnum opus. And what I basically was doing with that is in that one is distilling down the imagery, imagery to their essence. So see, we have the fool distilled down to like this uh, jongleur character. Now, the latest one I've done, which was one you know, we wanna focus on more right now is uh, the alchemical tarot of Marseille. And in the alchemical tarot of Marseille, what I did is I based the imagery much more clearly on, you know, in my own style, but more clearly on the uh, Marseille cards. Now the Marseille cards are basically folk art. So I was trying to create a more realistic imagery, but still influenced by, uh, by imagery from, you know, from the 1400s and 1500s, like uh, uh, to get the, fla the Renaissance flavor of the imagery. So, so this is the fool I came up with. You see, he's, he's a jongleur, he's, he's dressed in motley, he has his pack on his back and the dog's sort of like, it's in between, it's not quite biting him, but it's sort of like looking like, you know, I, I could bite you if I want, right? Okay, so now for each of these, I also, I put this symbol here, which was th this symbol at the top, the circle with the triangle and the square as a symbol for the magnum opus. And because the fool is taking the journey through the magnum opus, I gave him the symbol for the whole magnum opus. Um, now, but I also put a quote on each one. Now, the, these quotes are from the Corpus Hermeticum, which is the ancient book of Hermetic philosophy that was written in Alexandria in the first centuries after Christ. So this, this in fact, this is the first line from the first book of the, of the uh, Hermetica. And it says, once on a, I have to bend my head sideways to read it here. Once on a time when I had become, when I begun to think about things that are, and my thoughts had soared, high and aloft. So see, in other words, that's basically the Hermetica is written from the point of view of a, a mythical character called Hermes Trismegistus, who was an ordinary person, supposedly, in, uh, in, in ancient times and around the time of Moses. 
and and uh, through um, his his uh, his uh, philosophical quest, he came in he came in contact with divine mind or primandries, which is the you know the name of the first text in in the uh, Hermetica, and and primandries uh, brought him into a greater knowledge called gnosis, and by becoming enlightened, what we might say in more modern terms. Uh, through this gnosis, uh, he became like a god. Now remember, this is a, they were polytheistic, so there's many gods. You know, like Hercules through his his heroic uh, endeavors became a god also. So so the idea was that the Hermetica is a, is a textbook to how to become a god, or in more modern terms, how to become enlightened. So so here's our character starting out on his road towards enlightenment, and then the first character he meets is uh, the magician. Now you see here, the magician is what I now. E, now each card, leading up to the to the world card, is one of the processes or sub substances in the alchemical great work. So the first one is Hermes, who is the god of alchemy, but he's also the materia prima, which you can see here on my uh, opus deck, where you know I'm distilling it down to his essence. He's a drop of pure liquid that's the materia prima. And, but also we often, like the cultists often talk about his gesture saying as above, so below, which was the hermetic axiom that comes from the Emerald Tablet, which is a, a famous, uh, you know, uh, alchemical text. But we can find, but that alchemical text is later and it's basically echoing something from the first century that's in the Hermetica, which is, which is right here on my uh, Batalur card. It, it must be that all the world which lies below has been set in order and filled with contents by things which are placed above. You see, as above, so below. Yeah, in other words, there, there's a spiritual force and there's a connection between the, the spiritual world and the physical world. They're not separate. This symbol is, this, is, is a basically, that's the glyph for, uh, for Mercury or Hermes. But in this particular one, you see how it's really composed of the glyph for uh, the moon, the sun, and the cross of matter all combined. And that, com and that comes from another alchemical text called the Mutus Liber. See here, we can see that glyph right in here in the, in the vessel. And then you see in the Mutus Liber, the materia prima is, 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 is thought to be dew, which contains this essence, which is Hermes, who combines both the sun and the moon. And so that's, you know, that's the materia prima coming down to earth. And here, here's our original Batalor, you see, who's a, again he's another kind of jongleur he's wearing motley and he's and he's and, and he and we, we call him the juggler and of course the english word juggler comes from jongleur and uh and he's performing his tricks at, at, a, at a, a fair or something and then by the time we get to the way smith card he's considered a ceremonial magician now i don't have time to go through all the cards so i'm going to jump to the end because i think that's the most important thing for you to understand let's see where are we at? where's my end cards here Okay, there, here we have the judgment, and then we have the world. Now, remember, I told you this quincunx is a type of mandala that, you know, is, is a Christian icon. And here we have the Christ and majesty icon, which is, is you know, the standard, this is from a, uh, my rendering of a 13th century Bible cover. And you see Christ is sitting in its almond shape with the four evangelists in the corner. And this is based on an image of him and, uh, written in Revelation, the last chapter of the Bible. Uh, in the New Testament, where he's supposed to be the judge at the last judgment. And you see he has the, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet on either side of him, alpha and omega, meaning he's before the beginning and the end. He brings everything together. In other words, he's timeless. This type of imagery is really ancient. It's pre-Christian, you see. Like here, this is the Orphic Phineas from the second century and, and how uh, this uh, Phineas, according to, uh, to the Orphic Mysteries, was the first being who hatched out of the world egg. And you, see, you can see how this aura around him is really the zodiac, which is the wheel of time. And then the four winds are in the four corners representing the four directions. So he's again in the center of the world. Now, the oldest one I could find tracing it back is uh, the, this mistress of the animals. From This is from a, a, a Greek phase from 675 BC. Um, and you can see this goddess, basically the goddess of nature. We don't even know the names of this goddess, but by, class, by the classical time, she became Artemis or Diana, the goddess of the hunt and of animals. But you can see how she's in the center of the world in this quincunx with the animals in the corners. And in case you didn't get it, there's these little swastikas and crosses all around here showing the same sort of pattern. And then 
uh, and but she also represents um, the mistress of the four elements because we have lions representing the earth, we have eagles representing air, we have the fish on her skirt representing water, and then the there's the ox. See, here's the head and the rear end of an ox, which would be sacrificed in the fire, representing fire. But it's also the head and the and the and the rear, like the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. Okay, so now putting that all together, this is what I came up with for the originally for my uh, chemical tarot, where we have the uh, the Anima Mundi figure on the heart, similar to the way uh, we saw in the in the original mandala in the center of the cross with the four elements in the corner, and there's the rosebud coming out. But you see how she's got Hermes sandals, uh, Solarii, and the Caduceus, and she's also holding the rose. Now, in the uh, in my newest version. You see, okay, so here's, this is the, the uh, Lapis Philosophorum, which means the Philosopher's Stone, and that was for the uh, Opus deck, where you can see I, I simplified her, her persona into the heart here, and, I, and of course, the wreath has become the Ouroboros, which is the, uh, you know, the symbol of, of time. Now, in the newest deck, Limon, uh, this quote, from, I really love this quote from the uh, 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 Hermeticum, the Corpus Hermeticum. O oh, thou eternal consistency of that which stands unmoved, it makes the world revolve. In other words, she's the unmoved mover, like the, the, you know that uh, Aristotle talked about, like the, 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 the force above that puts the whole world in order, or the anima mundi, the soul of the world. It's a more modern term. Like the thing is, uh, uh, Gamon, which is the, the uh, modern publisher who produces who publishes the Toro of Marseille calls it the Toro of Marseille and then and we find certain occultists like Elifus Levy called the, the the French Toro the Toro of Marseille but it's basically just the French Toro now the French Toro the Toro didn't originate in France originated in Italy basically um cards were introduced into Spain and Sicily from the Islamic cultures uh sometime in the, in the 1300s but the playing cards they introduced, it was called the Mumluck deck, and it had four suits, which were uh, scimitars, uh, polo sticks, cups, and coins. And, and so uh, when the Spanish and the Italians started copying the deck, they turned the, the imagery into the familiar uh, suits we see as we call the minor suits in the tarot, but these were the original four suit decks. Uh, so, the, so the cups and coins, and then the scimitars just became swords, and the polo sticks became staves or batons. And and that's how we you know our staff you know so so we so now those four suits were considered the standard decks and still are in parts of Italy and, and Spain and old Spanish speaking countries still use four suit decks with those suits. Now what happened in the early 1400s is a, a new type of game was created, you know because cards were uh, cards were mostly used for playing games, but all cards could be used for divination, just like dice were for games and dice could be used for divination. Uh, so. A new type of game was developed in the 1400s in northern Italy uh, called triumphi, and and uh, and this is where their word in English word trump comes from from triumphi, and triumphi is a type of parade in which each character trumps the one that came before. So uh, and 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 this is a trick taking game. That's the ancestor bridge. So so then this this fifth suit was added of the trumps, which is that mystical allegory that you know that that. Um, we it's the whole reason we pay attention to Torah because of the fifth suit because that's what's so intriguing about it so now the, now uh, in Italy there were several variations of this but the variation that it seems the latest evidence suggests that the variation that influenced most the Torah of Marseille originated in Florence and then and and, and the Torah seemed to spread out from Florence and when it came to Milan like each city-state remember Italy wasn't one place each city-state has its own uh, version of the Tarot in its own order. And the one in Milan seemed to influence France, especially because uh, the, the, uh, Charles XII, who was the King of France, invaded Milan in uh, uh, 1499, I believe it was. And, and so Milan basically became part of France. And so there was a cultural exchange going on. And, and the, the Tarot, uh, although the French might have been uh, you know, aware of the Tarot before that, but there was a big exchange of culture and the Tarot then started being produced in France more, more readily. And then the French model was strongly based on the uh, Milan model. And, that, and, and if, in fact, that world card with the Quincunx world card, uh, the, the earliest ones we know of are, uh, are from Milan. Like 
when, when they were uh, they were restoring Sforza Castle in Milan, um, they, they found old tarot cards in the wall. You know how like when you, you're doing renovation, you find all kinds of strange things in the walls of a house. Well, when you have a castle that's centuries old, you know, you find things like tarot cards and things. So the, that's the oldest version of that world card. And, and uh, basically the, the Tarot of Marseille is really the French Tarot, but it wasn't only produced in France. It became that style of Tarot uh, that we're more familiar with that, we, that is considered a standard deck now. And um, it, it, it was, there were ones produced in, in Marseille, there were ones produced in Paris, but they were also produced in Switzerland and, and, and Northern Italy. And even ones in Northern Italy, uh, especially in the Piedmont, which is the area near France had French titles on them. Although the one I, sh I showed you before from Milan had, had they had switched to Italian by then. Like Court of Jebelon uh, was a, 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 a mason and a cultist uh, who lived in, in, uh, in Paris in the 1700s. He's originally from Switzerland. And uh, he wrote this, he had this theory that all the, all the um, magic and philosophy and religion all around the world, all came from one common source. Like it was basically the myth of the golden age, but he felt it was a reality. And that like all our modern ideas stem from this a golden age when these, when these very enlightened people lived on earth and, that, and, and their last contact with them was in Egypt. And of course, this is a time of all this discovery of this amazing ancient civilizations in Egypt, you know, and, and uh, you know, how the Europeans were like enamorated with everything Egyptian. So they decided to throw, he decided the throw must have really come from Egypt. Now, in, in his, his, his encyclopedia, he was trying to, he was delving into everything he knew about, about uh, all these different cultures and trying to find these connections. And when he found connections, mythological connections or linguistic connections, he, he, he used that as evidence that there was some common source. Uh, in modern, more modern terms, like in Jungian psychology, for instance, what he was really uncovering with myth mythology was uh, the archetypes. And then, of course, he, he basically uh, helped invent the, the science of etymology and like looking at the roots of words and seeing how they connect. Of course, a lot of his, what he did was guesswork and he was off and he, and he didn't have as much information as we have. So he was just making use of the information uh, at the time. He was a pioneer, but of course, every, he had gone way beyond what he, what he said. Now, the encyclopedia he wrote was in nine volumes. It was called Moon Primitive. And, then, and he would sell subscriptions to it. And so it was sort of pre-sold before it came out. And, and he was very influential. Like the, the Masonic Lodge he belonged to in Paris was the same one that uh, Voltaire was initiated into and that Benjamin Franklin uh, went to when, when he was in Paris. And, uh, you know, and, and, the, and he knew the king and he knew, you know, he, he knew all these nobles. He, like. Uh, Accord de was was really influential, but it but he he put the essay on the tarot in the uh, eighth the next to the last volume the eighth volume of the encyclopedia which came out in, in uh, 1781, and uh, right after his essay he put another essay by the Comte de Malay which uh, an acquaintance of his. Now the Comte de Malay was actually. Uh, uh, it, it seems that the Comte de Malay's essay is more is more complete than his, and, and it was probably written first, and probably was the thing that most influenced him. And the Comte de Malay also believed that the that the Tarot uh, came from ancient Egypt, but his but the concept he has of ancient Egypt is uh, it's not our modern idea. It's 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 more like uh, the uh, you know uh, how Egypt appeared in the, during the Roman period. Um, and because you know he's talking about Jupiter and Juno being in the cards and things like that, although he also includes Isis and Osiris. Now, uh, recently, in fact, I've just I realized that he the the, uh, the tarot deck that Comte de Malay uh, describes is is really the first occult version of a tarot deck. So I've been really recently my newest deck that I'm working on right now is I'm creating a deck based on his descriptions, and he looked at the. He looked at the trumps in reverse order. He felt that the first, like the world was actually the first card, which represented Isis creating the world, and then worked back and using uh, the, the, the uh, mythological pattern uh, we find from ancient Greece that the world was created through four ages, which is the age of gold, silver, uh, usually it's called bronze or copper, and then iron, that, that the cards represented these four ages uh, as you went back in reverse order. 
Now, what's left unsaid in that is that if, okay, so if, if we're going from the golden age down to our modern age of iron, where everything's corrupted, and we get down to the fool, who's like, a, he considered him a madman, uh, then if we go back through the cards in, you know, what we now consider the proper order, we're actually moving up towards enlightenment, or, which is the hermetic philosophy. We're moving back towards the, the, uh, the vision of enlightenment and, and creation. So, uh, so that so anyway so that's the basis of all uh, all our uh, uh, you know occult ideas like and, and a lot of what is in in one primitive is is wrong in that the cards don't come from ancient Egypt the cards they didn't have cards in ancient Egypt uh, the cards were, cre were created in China first and they made their way you know across the world long after the Egyptian culture was was you know uh, dissipated into Islam and uh, the the, uh, the the cards that are in the uh, the trumps the, the fifth suit were really created in Italy but the thing is the thing in at that time in the 1400s in Italy all the artists were influenced influenced by hermeticism like when we find that in, in uh, Botticelli and Michelangelo Leonardo they're all influenced by hermetic philosophy and of course that's what comes through in the tarot as well and hermetic philosophy does come from Egypt, but it comes from um, this the synthesis of Egypt that happened in the in you know Hellenistic period when uh, when Greek and Egyptian culture were mixed, and then and then that influenced the Roman Empire, and the cult of Isis spread all through. In fact, there were even temples uh, of Isis and can be found in England. That's how prevalent the Egyptian uh, religion was during the Roman Empire. So so. So there's so there's see there's some uh, basic truths in in what uh, Corte Giblon and Colonel Lay are talking about, but um, it led to a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of cultists after that sort of jumped on it and then started uh, going off in all kinds of tangents, which I don't find you know a lot of what occults say I don't find very helpful, and that's why I'm more interested in what uh, you know Colonel Lay had to say right now. Because a lot of people look at the tarot cards like they they want the tarot cards to foretell the future which I don't find is a very useful use of the tarot cards. I really use the tarot cards um, to, to get advice. I want the tarot cards to get advice from my inner wisdom, from what I call my higher self and help me make decisions. But I've found that in dreams, sometimes my dreams do foretell the future. So, so I really think that if you're unconscious, your higher self wants you to know something that's happened in the future. It'll, the unconscious will tell you in a dream. And, uh, and it, and, and and see, scholars that study divination divide it into three groups. It's there's uh, uh, there's uh, in, in in intuitive, uh, in, in inductive, and interpretive. And um, th so the thing is the 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 first like basically, it's dream divination. because uh, I mean the oldest form of divination has to be dreams because dreams come to us. As, uh, you know, we have dreams before we're even human. And, and most ancient people believe that dreams um, are, um, are you know, they would look at it as messages from the gods, basically. So, so we might say, okay, in, in more Jungian terms, we say from the, our, our archetypal inner uh, selves, our higher self. Um, and I find that's true. If you pay attention to dreams and you look at them like they're instructing you, they're, they're giving you insights into what's happening in your life. They don't because you know, psychologists might look at dreams and, and look at, as a way of analyzing uh, your neurosis and and and, and uh, things from your child and your past. But when I look at my dreams, I mean, I've had dreams where I had a problem with the computer and the dream told me how to fix it. You know, I mean, or I had dreams where it told me things that I was going to do months ahead of time in great detail and with details I couldn't possibly know. So so the. So it's just a matter of paying attention and, and remembering your dreams when you wake up and seeing what they say and then letting them be what they are and not con confining them. And that's dream divination. Now what, and like the next one, like, if, like see some people would say, okay, well then if you have, you have the gods talk to you through your dreams, then you gotta wait till they talk to you, right? Okay, now you could do, uh, you could do uh, a sort of like go into a vision quest and try to ha have a, a waking dream where you, you like try to induce it. Or you could try to tell yourself when you go to sleep that you dream about something, you know, and, and try and direct it. But then another thing is that you can look at your waking life as if it's a dream and interpret 
things that have your symbols, and that's called omens, and that's the next type, you see. And, that, and that's where people start looking for uh, omens, like they look, look at the flight of birds and, and uh, the, the, uh, the uh, you know, like the ancient augurs who look at the flight of birds, but that also leads to astrology. And that's what astrology is based on. It's like, okay, the things that happen out, out in the world, the physical world actually have meaning, they're symbolic. But the last type is like where we actually, we wanna give ourselves some pattern that we can interpret so that anytime we have a question we can make a, make a, a like a, a random pattern, but then, the pattern has meaning, so that could, so that's called lots, or uh, or you know, uh, you know, uh, divination with dice or cards, things like that. Where and basically, you need some kind of grid or that gives it meaning, which is which uh, would be the like if you threw down the dice, you it, it's a lot of times there were uh, a certain board you would throw them on that would give meaning to depending on where they land, and that's basically what a pattern is when you do what your layout is when you're doing a tarot reading. It's like you're creating the grid. That has meaning. So these cards that fall to the left mean something, and the ones that fall to the right mean something, and 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 therefore you it gives you an interpretation. But I find that 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 card divination is really helpful for giving you direction and, and getting communication going with your higher self. But if your higher self wants you to know the future, it's more likely to tell you in a dream. Okay. Well, see, the thing is, there's, there's different parts to the to the, to the hero's journey. There, you know, basically you start off with normal everyday life, which we which we would say. Uh, you know, like the fool starts off with with the mundane world, which is the the temple. Uh, you know, the four uh, uh, physical rulers, the rulers of the temporal world. You know, like the uh, the pope, the papist, the emperor, the empress, and and then and and it, and ha but he has to go beyond that challenge somehow. And then also there's also a guide at the beginning who would be like the magician card, who's this guide into the into the process. Then there's a, like a rejection. And then you have to take on the hardships, you know, which could be life threatening, which is then we see that's the center of the cards where we have, you know, we have uh, the will of fortune, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, the hanged man, which is suffering, you know, the, the ordeal, and then the hero has to face death, but by facing death, then they, they, they get to the magic elixir that they have to bring back, you know, the hero has to, has to heal the problem, so he has to come back with uh, with the solution with the magic elixir and then that's the philosopher's stone in the end or like you're healing the world i mean i, I mean roughly that's you know uh, shows how they can end you, you have to be patient and 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 it's an ongoing process it's like the process is 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 uh, the work just you know do if see you know what like i for years i was giving a course at the uh new york open center which you know, I haven't been doing lately because of the pandemic, but um, it, the name of the course was the Tarot is a Spiritual Journey. And basically the idea of the course was that as you, um, as you use the cards day to day and ask for advice about, you know, how to make the best choice, basically the cards from your higher self, are, they're, they're helping you become your higher self. They're telling you, well, if you were your higher self, you would do this. And, and it's a better choice than than some stupid reaction you were going to make. So, so that becomes a spiritual journey because you're becoming more and more your spiritual self. Now, a lot of people would misinterpret that thing like, oh, I'm going to do the reading and it's telling me I'm a spiritual person and I'm so great. And like, no, I don't want, basically what I would tell my students is I want the cards to kick you in the ass and tell you where you're a jerk because, you know, that's how you're going to grow. The, the, the row, you have to let the tarot tell you, uh, you know, how, how to make changes and where you're going wrong. And then, and I mean, it's basically the same thing you do as an artist. The only reason I can improve my drawings is I keep looking at what's wrong with them and, and fixing it and fixing it and fixing it and it gets better and better and better. And that's basically what you're doing with yourself. Look at yourself as a, a work of art.